The US dollar, which fell off a cliff at the end of last year and spent much of the first half of this year in purgatory, is once again on a tear. The dollar has been moving up in the 2023 performance ranking of major currencies. Placed into historical perspective, the dollar is so strong that on a broad trade weighted basis, it is now trading in the top 10 percentile of its range over the past 40 years. All of a sudden, everyone on Wall Street is talking about the strong dollar. Why is it so strong? Where is it headed? Will it spell troubles for the world? Hi, I'm David Wu, a former IMF economist and Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record of making actionable predictions about the big story shaping our world tomorrow. Since July, the Bellwether DXY index has been climbing, practically in a straight line. The dollar has been moving up. It is now just behind the Mexican peso in the Brazilian real and tied in third place with the British pound in the Swiss franc. With its recent gains, the dollar has racked up serious gains against the Chinese RMB, the South African Rand, and the Russian ruble. Indeed, if we were to rank currencies in terms of where they are currently versus historical range on an inflation-adjusted basis, the dollar is leading all other major currencies, including the Singaporean dollar, the Swiss franc, and the Indian rupee. The dollar's latest surge has been so strong that China is stepping up interventions to support the sliding RMB. The decline of the Japanese yen beyond the psychologically important 150 level against the dollar this week prompted speculation that the Bank of Japan may soon have to step in to support the yen. It is not a coincidence that the dollar's comeback is accompanied by surging U.S. real yields, meaning the yields on inflation-protected treasury securities. Like the dollar, U.S. real yields have been rising since July. This week, 10-year real yields hit 2.4%, the highest level since 2008. High real yields make U.S. bonds more attractive to investors, especially given increasing concerns that higher inflation may be here to stay. In relative terms, higher U.S. real yields make U.S. bonds much more attractive than their counterparts in other developed economies like Japan, Germany, France, and the U.K. This is why the appetite of foreign investors for U.S. government bonds is growing, while the appetite of U.S. investors for foreign bonds is waning. This is notwithstanding the fact that foreigners already bought $2 trillion worth of U.S. bonds in just the past two years. But who are these foreigners who have been buying U.S. bonds as though there were no tomorrow? Certainly, it is not China. The July data on foreign holdings of U.S. government bonds shows that China, the second largest holders of U.S. government bonds in the world, offloaded another $13.6 billion worth of U.S. bonds. Certainly, it's not the Saudis either. Despite rising oil price and oil revenue, the Saudis recently cut their holdings of U.S. government bonds to a six-year low. I think it's fair to assume that it was not the Russians either. So who's been busy scooping up U.S. bonds? When we look at the breakdown of foreign purchase of U.S. bonds between foreign official buyers like central banks and foreign private buyers, the picture becomes very clear. It is mostly foreign private buyers like pension funds, insurance companies, and investment funds. A lot of the foreign buying has been coming from Europe. This is consistent with the appreciation of the dollar against the euro over the past three months as real yield differential began to move in favor of the greenback. Indeed, given the current level of real yield differential, I suspect we have not seen the end of the dollar rally against the euro. I suspect we'll be seeing parity once again and not before long. So the dollar is going up because U.S. real yields are going up. So why are real yields going up? There are many reasons, but the main reason is that monetary policy tightening by the Federal Reserve does not seem to be achieving the desired effect on slowing the U.S. economy. Incredibly, 18 months into the most aggressive monetary tightening in decades, that includes a sizable reduction of the Fed's holdings of U.S. government bonds, the U.S. economy is not yet buckling under. Indeed, according to the Atlanta Fed's GDP Now casting model, the U.S. economy grew 5% in the third quarter. 
The economy is doing so well that last week the Federal Reserve revised up its growth forecast for 2024 to 1.5%, up from 1.1%. It also revised up its forecast of the Fed funds rate to above 5% at the end of 2024. In other words, the Fed is warning the market not to expect a rate cut anytime soon. This piece of news helped push up real yields, which is the best proxy we have of the monetary policy stance that is appropriate for the economy at any given point in time. So why isn't the US economy slowing, given the Fed's policy tightening of the past 18 months? The implication is that one or more of the main monetary policy transmission channels are not working. There are three main channels. First, the interest rate channel. The idea is that when the Fed raises short-term interest rates, long-term borrowing costs will also go up, which in turn will crimp domestic demand, such as corporate and household spending. Given most of the borrowing in the US economy is long-term, in other words, the borrowing costs are locked in for many years, the increase in short-term interest rates have yet to be felt widely across the US economy. Indeed, as I pointed out in another video two weeks ago, US household debt servicing remains at just 10% of disposable income, which is near the low end of the historical range. Don't get me wrong, the interest rate channel will work in the end, but it will take a bit of time. This is what the Fed means when they talk about the lag effect of their policy. Second, the currency channel. The idea is that when the Fed raises interest rates, it will push up the US dollar that ought to have the effect of depressing foreign demand for US goods and services. If this channel is working, we're not seeing much evidence of it. Indeed, the US current account deficit has narrowed modestly over the past 18 months, most likely reflecting a shift in domestic demand from tradable goods towards services. In any event, US exports are just 10% of US GDP, which means the currency channel of monetary policy transmission is not that important for the US. This leaves us with the third main channel, the wealth channel. The idea is that when interest rates go up, house prices and stock prices will suffer. As people become less wealthy, they will cut back on their spending. The wealth channel is a very important monetary policy transmission channel for the United States. What is very clear is that it is definitely not working. Data released a few weeks ago by the Federal Reserve shows that US households' net worth soared to $154 trillion as of the end of June, the highest on record, due to a combination of rising home and stock prices. Yes, US home prices are once again marching higher, after a brief dip last year. This is quite a stunning development, given that partly due to the massive increase in mortgage rate, housing affordability is lower now than was the case at the height of the housing bubble in the mid-2000s. The sharp decline in affordability is why mortgage applications have collapsed to levels that we have not seen since the mid-1990s. So why are home prices going up if nobody can afford to buy a home with 30-year fixed rate mortgages at over 7%? The answer is actually very simple. The inventory of unsold homes is extremely low. In fact, the lowest in decades. House prices are going up because there are simply not enough homes for sale, even for the shrinking number of people who can still afford to buy. Why is the inventory of unsold homes so low? The reason is because the US has not been building enough homes for 10 years. Housing starts collapsed after the financial crisis of 2008 and 9, and still has not fully recovered. Ironically, this is helping to support home prices now. home prices have recovered, so have stock prices after the slump in 2022. S&P 500 is up 11% year-to-date. We're not yet back to the level we saw at the end of 2021, but we're not too far away either. Why have stocks gone up when corporate earnings are down? But most importantly, with 10-year U.S. real yields at 2.4%, U.S. equity valuation is at its most extreme in more than 20 years. My statement is not about U.S. stocks in general. Indeed, as you can see on this chart, on an equally weighted basis, 
S&P 500 is slightly down on the year, and in fact near the low of the past three years. As you probably already know, almost all of the gains from S&P 500 this year has come from just seven stocks, the so-called Magnificent Seven. Indeed, the market capitalization of these seven stocks went up by nearly $5 trillion this year, with a big part of it going towards boosting U.S. household net worth. What I'm trying to say is that the massive rally in these seven stocks is a major reason why the wealth channel of monetary policy transmission has been broken. High interest rates have failed to dampen the enthusiasm for these stocks. The positive wealth effect created by the rally of these stocks has made Americans feel wealthier and encouraged them to go out and spend more money. So what has driven up these stocks? ChatGPT has definitely been a catalyst, or at least an excuse, depending whether you think the rally is justified. But what is without a shadow of doubt is that foreign buyers have been net buyers. What you can see on this chart is that while foreign buying of U.S. stocks picked up in June and July, U.S. investors turned net sellers of foreign stocks. We don't have the data for August and September yet, but given how strong the dollar has been lately, it would not surprise me that foreign buying of U.S. stocks kept up during the summer. We don't have any data on what American stocks foreigners have been buying, but my educated guess based on conversations with Europe and Asia-based equity investors, is that the Magnificent Seven make up a big part of their U.S. shopping. Global equity investors have been fleeing the Chinese stock market and reducing their exposure to the European stock market. What they see in the Magnificent Seven is not only safe havens, but protected by what Warren Buffett calls big moats. Many of these companies are virtual monopolies with exceptional pricing power in their respective markets. These companies also enjoy political protection by Washington that sees them as the goose that lays the golden eggs. The problem is that these companies are trading at very high earning multiples that are difficult to justify based on their growth outlook. And there is, of course, an election in the U.S. just around the corner that may weaken their political clout. I am not smart enough to tell you when this bubble will burst. But I can tell you with confidence that one, it is not sustainable, and two, when it does, it will hit the U.S. economy hard and usher in a bear market for the U.S. dollar. Until the bubble pops, I cannot rule out that U.S. real yields will continue to play catch up to the Fed funds rate in taking the dollar higher in its ride. Given the dollar's reserve currency status, higher U.S. bond yields likely mean higher bond yields globally. Higher bond yields mean higher borrowing costs. Even if the U.S. can somehow live with higher borrowing costs for now, it is highly unlikely that the rest of the world can, especially given the global economy has lost all momentum for all practical purposes. If we do get a recession a year from now, you will know that the Magnificent Seven mania had a big part to play. In the 1960s version of the movie, Steve McQueen, who played Vin, had this to say about someone he knew in El Paso. What I don't understand is why a man like you took the job in the first place. Hmm? Why? Hmm? I wonder myself. No, come on, come on, tell me why. Like a fellow I once knew in El Paso one day, he just took all his clothes off and jumped in a mess of cactus. I asked him the same question, why? And? He said it seemed to be a good idea at the time. My bet is that a year from now, people will say the same about buying the Magnificent Seven right now. But what do I know? If you got something out of this program, please hit like and subscribe to my free YouTube channel. Let me know what you think by posting your comments on the video. If you want to learn more about my investment strategy, come visit us at davidwuunbound.com.